Greetings, and I uh, hope you're doing well. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, why don't we pray as we begin today, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for an opportunity to look at, at your word. And, and as we study today, I pray that we would sense your speaking, that we would see what you want us to see. Lord, I pray you would guide my words and ask that you would um, you just speak through me any way you want to today. Thank you for your word and that we can, we can seek wisdom in it. We can find hope and we can find the, the, that conversation that you want to have with us. And so we pray that you would just sit down and, and you'd help us to hear you today as, as you speak to us through your word. And I thank you for, for all that are listening today and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as we begin, I want to do a, a uh, just a short review. A couple weeks back, so we had we had Palm Sunday and we had uh, Easter Sunday or, or Resurrection Sunday, and and uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get uh, the Resurrection Sunday recorded. It was uh, uh, or actually Palm Sunday. We've been I was out of town for our district event, which is kind of our annual meeting, and and then. Uh, uh, we were in the gym on Sunday with one service, and so that schedule kind of messes everything up. Uh, but we're back running again as normal. And so um, we were looking at Luke chapter 18, and Jesus had just had, had, just had this, this little inter- interaction with his disciples. His disciples were, were rebuking, is what we're told. They were rebuking the parents that were bringing their kids to Jesus, wanting Jesus to, to bless their children. And, and I, I read that story, and first of all, I read it as a parent, right? And I'm like, how can the world can the disciples do that? And how could they be so, like, I don't know, unkind and and uncaring? I mean, who wouldn't want their child to be blessed by Jesus, right? And so so Jesus sees that, and he's like, hey, knock it off. Let the children come to me. And then he says, unless you become like a little child, you won't won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And and so this story is found in a couple other gospels, and sometimes they kind of run together for me. But as we look at, at that, as we looked at that, the question kind of rose in my head of, okay, so what does, he, what does he mean? Because what he expresses is, is this desire for us to be like little children. Now, th- there are some things about little children that we would say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? I mean, children stay immature. They don't really, they don't work. They don't, uh, they, they just have a whole lot to learn, and, and uh, they don't really um, contribute, I guess maybe that would be the the, the piece of it. And so, you know, is that, that's not, that probably isn't what Jesus is talking about. And it's not. So the three things that I kind of came up with that, that, uh, that I think were, were valuable and um, could, could use our focus is that uh, um, the little children have a sense of wonder. You know, as we grow up, we, we kind of we kind of see things differently, right? We, we, we explain things away. We're, we're not as uh, amazed by, by just the, the surroundings, the things around us. And so um, it's easy for us to lose that wonder. We explain miracles away. We get busy and we don't even notice what God's doing around us. And yet children, children can have this sense of amazement and wonder. And you know what? God is amazing and and we don't want to lose that we don't lose that sense of wonder and so that's one of the things that children have and the next thing we said is, is that the children have this capacity to forgive all right a capacity to forgive and you know in dealing with my, my kids sometimes they get mad at each other and and then we, we run through this little uh this little exercise and i wouldn't call it an exercise but as i look at it it's kind of this exercise and the exercise is is hey you need to say you're sorry no hey you need to say you're sorry and eventually you know they say oh i'm sorry and then we look at the other child and we say hey what do you say it's okay right but but we imagine as adults if that's the that's what we went through except for that's exactly what god calls us to god calls us to ask for forgiveness to seek perfect forgiveness and he also calls us to be forgiving and so the children have this capacity to forgive and the last thing is is the children are immersed in trust i mean they don't even realize how much they need or depend on their parents right they're not really capable of survival on their own and they rest in it it doesn't worry them they don't lose sleep over it they can be immersed in trust and they don't and it is so 
it is so consuming for them, they are, they are at peace. Isn't that what we should have in our Heavenly Father, right? And so that's what we looked at last week. Now the story continues, right? As Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, this is going to be really strange as we move forward because we're not that far away from the study in Luke of Jesus' crucifixion. And so we're going we're gonna to get to his crucifixion again as we, uh, as we kind of study his, the, the book of Luke. And I, I think that's all right. It's okay, I think it's okay to, to look at the resurrection of Christ in other times than just as on Resurrection Sunday. So, so we're, it's, we're coming. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and uh, uh, as he's interacting with the crowds, this is what we're told. It's found in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. It says this, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, we're just going to stop there, okay? Because he goes on to answer the, the, the ruler's question. He goes on to, 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 to jump into the question. But he stops here. And I, it's really tempting to just kind of move on to his answer. It's really tempting to move on to the answer to what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? But he stops with, whoa, whoa, whoa. You call me good. Why do you call me good? All right? Now, now those aren't the words necessarily. But, but he says, you know, only God is good. Well, what are you saying to me here, right? So there is something there that, that we could just kind of zip right over and go, oh, well, you know, Jesus is God, so, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, 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 no. There is something that maybe we just need, that, that we could maybe learn in this passage, all right? So as we begin to study this, this part of the passage, I, this is where I kind of got stuck. It didn't feel like we could continue to move on until we covered this. So Jesus makes it a point to, to, to kind of highlight or pull out what wasn't even part of the guy's um, question, right? I mean, Jesus has this way of being approached, and, and he cuts through all the garbage, and he goes right to the heart of things. No, it has to do with, the, in this, it has to do with how the guy sees Jesus. It, it, as it comes to, as we cut through this, it has to do with how is he interpreting who he's in front of? In other words, does he see him as God or not? Right? But, but as, we, as we look at it, what we say, what we see is, is he goes, he, he wants to make, uh, make an issue of, Jesus does, of this being called good teacher. No, he calls himself the good shepherd. So this isn't one of those moments where, uh, you know, that, that it, the problem with, with the word isn't necessarily, you know, it isn't just that he's called good. It's there's something about the one who's asking it. And so Jesus wants to make sure that, that it's, it's addressed, all right? So before we get to, you know, Jesus kind of says, hey, before we get to your question, let's just, let's stop here for a minute here. You've called me good. So I just, I thought, you know what, what do we need to talk about here? And, and, and I think, I think we could just say, well, Jesus is God, God is good, let's move on, right? But, I, and that would be a pretty simple one. But, but I want us to look maybe just a little deeper. And I, and, I, and I asked the question, as I was looking at this, I said, well, you know, to myself, I said, well, is, is Jesus, I mean, is he a good teacher? Is he a good teacher, right? I mean, I mean you have, do you guys think Jesus is a good teacher? If, if we just look at, at his teaching method, his, what he does, what his results are, is he a good teacher? And it, well, have you ever had a good teacher? Uh, I have a very short list. Many years in school, you know, uh, seven years in college, I have, I, have a, I have a very, but I have a very short list of good teachers. I, I have some experience with teachers. I've experienced good teachers and I've experienced bad teachers. But there's a strange thing about the teachers that I would call good. The strange thing that I would call about the teachers that are good is, is, is there's a lot of variation. In other words, I, some, of, some of my teachers that I would say are good were tough and some were easy. Hmm. Some of my good teachers were incredibly intelligent about what they were teaching 
And some of my, my good teachers were, what I would say, familiar with the subject. Some liked me. Some didn't even know my name. So what, what I would think would make a good teacher doesn't necessarily show up when I look at the teachers that I would call good. So as we look at Jesus, the good teacher, what, what do we need to see? Now, I did a little digging on, on what others say good teachers are, and, and, and in my digging, I came, ac- came across this, this uh, TED Talk. TED Talks are just these little short seminars. They're about 15 minutes long, and, and people try to condense this message into just a very short speech. And um, I've actually, this is my first TED Talk that I've ever watched, but it wasn't, this guy didn't seem like he was a Christian, uh, but he was presenting about, and his, his title was is How to Be a Bad Teacher. And so it caught my attention, and it doesn't sound very spiritual, I know, right? But as I listened to this, this little short seminar, this little short speech, what I, what, I, what I began to hear is, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What he's describing here is something that, that I see Jesus is like. And so I'm just going to use kind of his, his points, okay? And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Jesus in, 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 and compare him to what, what he would say is the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher, all right? Now, I want to make sure that, that I give the man credit, okay? His name was, was Newton Miller, all right? His name is Newton Miller. And so he makes this statement right off the bat. This is what he says is, is he says, the, the greatest measure of any teacher, okay, if Jesus is the good teacher, Let's just put him into this. If the greatest measurement of any teacher is what their students are capable of doing and demonstrating what they can do after they leave the classroom. Okay? So so a good teacher is measured by what 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 is produced. What can the student, what is the student capable of? Not only is what he capable of, but what is he living out? What is he what is he demonstrating? Okay? So you can say, if oh I had a good teacher, I gained all this knowledge, but if it is never applied and you never put it out there and use it, then maybe that's not necessarily a good teacher. All right? So my mind, it jumps to this passage when I hear that. What did Jesus, the good teacher, produce? Was he a good teacher? Does it, does it show up in what his students were, are capable of and, and what they demonstrated when they were out of the class? Jesus spent three years with the disciples and left. So the lesson he was lessons he was teaching, right? Three years of lessons. What do you think? Was he effective? I mean, did those lessons, did they stick? Did they demonstrate what he taught? Was he a good teacher? Now I understand that. See, I want to give credit where credit's due. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit kind of helped them put the pieces together from what he taught and and the scriptures. And all of it, you know, things changed. The Holy Spirit empowered them. And so, yeah, absolutely that, that, that we can't just say it was all because Jesus taught them and the disciples caught it and took off with it. The Holy Spirit was along the way, right? But, uh, but when Jesus ascended, there's this, this, I don't know if you looked at it as it's almost like the, the disciples then were taken out of the classroom. And listen, we sit here today because Jesus is a very good teacher. Because those 12 men went out and they lived what Jesus taught. He is, he was effective. Now, as, as Miller continued in his little thing, he, he gives us three pillars of what good teachers have, okay? Uh, he kind of boiled it down, and he said, these are the three things that we could say, that as they looked across the board of, of teachers, the good ones. This is the common denominator. Now, let me just say this. This is a man who did some study, some investigation of um, 
places like schools where the norm, the normal outcome of the school was lots of failure, okay? And yet there was these little bright spots, and, and they, they traced it down to, here, there was some good teachers in, these, in this system. And, and in that process, they kind of developed, okay, so what, what, uh, what makes a good teacher? And, and when you get a big enough sample group, right, you can say, okay, well, oh, look, at the, look at the common denominators here. Look at the things that are common. And so the first thing that, 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 that we're told that makes a good teacher is a good teacher uh, has adopted the I, not F rule. The I, not F rule, okay? So in other words, a good teacher has this rule, and I, I hope you're going, well, what is the I, not F rule? Well, well, the I stands for incomplete versus, or, or the F stands for fail, okay? So to teach somebody is to help them to develop a mastery over something to or to master a skill all right if we can if we can at least look at this jesus as the good teacher is developing in us a mastery of a skill a mastery of something or a mastery over something a good teacher not just a teacher but a good teacher what they do is they develop in their students a mastery of the subject or over the subject. So if you, if you look, a good math teacher is able, there's something that they do that, that is able to teach their students that, that no matter whatever problem they f that is faced mathematically, they know the principles, they, they've got the material, they can problem solve and they can figure it out because they have a mastery in, within the subject. And that's what a good teacher can do, all right? An important revelation for me in my relationship with Jesus has been to discover that as Jesus teaches me what, what I've normally done and what I carry with me, and maybe it's because of school experiences, but I, what I tend to, to see is when I sin or all the sin that, I've, that I carry with me from past stuff, right? I always kind of seen it as failure. A sin is, is failure. Now, failure, here's the problem. Failure in my head is associated with if you fail enough, you will be kicked out. I know people who failed enough classes in college, they were invited not to come back. That's a nice way of saying they were kicked out, okay? Okay. If I fail too many courses, I will get kicked out. And the problem is with that picture is sometimes I project that picture onto, onto Jesus. If I fail too many times, he's going to give up on me. Right? He, he, there is this, this thing inside of me that gets defeated. And I figure, what's the point? But the truth is, okay, if I look at, at all of this through the eyes of this developing mastery, okay, if I, if I look at it that way, what I begin to learn is I, I realize I learn best when I discover where I'm weak and then work to strengthen it. All of a sudden, oh, I took a test, right? And I got an F. What does that say? Well, I'm a failure. No, what it says is, oh, wait a minute, I don't have mastery over this subject yet. I need to, f it shows me what I don't know. It shows me where I need to work. Do we look at our spiritual weaknesses as places that we need to listen to the teacher more intently? Or do we just look at those, those, those spiritual weaknesses as places of failure? See, this is where I struggle. This is where... He is wanting to teach. Those, those places that we're succeeding, that's not where he's working on. That's not the teaching moments. It's the places that we're struggling. Because Jesus, the good teacher, wants us to have mastery over these areas. Jesus, Jesus, though, has adopted, or he's always been this way, right? 
instead of failure, we need to understand we are in, incomplete. Jesus isn't finished with us yet. We haven't, we haven't failed yet. We are just incomplete. But what are we going to do with that? Listen to the words of Paul to the Philippians, okay? So he's talking to the Philippians, and, and he, this is right off the bat as he, as he writes to them. And he, he says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, do you hear this? Will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The great letter grade hasn't been given out yet. All this happened is that we have been shown the places that we are incomplete. And, the, and that what we should trust is and we should recognize is, is that the good teacher is teaching us to have mastery in those areas. Now I want you to listen to this next place, all right? Uh, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 22 through 24, it says this, you were taught, oh, there's that word, you were taught, right? With regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of the minds, of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Can we look at that passage and can we say, here's what God's plan is for us, right? Is that we take off that old self and we put on the new self that we are made new. That he's changing the attitudes of our mind. As I read that passage, I go, ah, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite there yet. You know why? Because I'm incomplete. Because he's still working, and he's still gonna, he's gonna work until the day that he re Jesus returns. He's working in us. To have mastery over that we're not done putting on the new self we're not done taking off the old self yes absolutely when we receive jesus we are made new but there's also this process that happens what jesus is carrying on to completion is putting on the new self and the other places we find it is crucifying the sin nature that old self putting off the old self so those places that we might call failing is simply the place that the old self is needing to be put off or crucified. The place where we need to gain mastery. Can we at least agree to that to be able to say, look, we can, let's not call them failures, let's call them incompletes. Man, I'm done there. I, gotta, I, I have got to learn from him. Are we allowing Jesus to be our teacher? Or are we sunk in defeat? Because he's not the one stamping us with failure. He's the one telling us, hey, let's take that back, let's start working on it again, and let's figure this out. He is good. So therefore, his focus is mastery over our sin rather than simply following a rule like the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were focused on checking off these rules, right? And we can be critical of them. That's what they understood. But Jesus comes along as the good teacher and his teaching style and what he's doing is, is a bit different. Okay, so as we continue, a, a good teacher, right? A good teacher has this pillar of they've adopted the I, not F, the, the incomplete rather than the failure mo mode. A good teacher also uh, uses exemplars as examples, all right? Now, exemplars are probably not things that we, um, that we would use, but, but basically w uh, a real-life picture of an example of what it looks like to succeed in other words, a good teacher starts with the end in mind. Does Jesus start with the end in mind? Think about it. Does Jesus know where he's taking us? Absolutely. Does he have a plan? He absolutely does. He knows what he is doing. And so the good, a good teacher 
starts with the yin in mind. And they show students what an A project looks like. Jesus knows what he's developing in us. He knows what he is attempting to create in us. And I say attempting because we play a part in it, all right? So as we look at the scripture, we can see lots of stories of God using flawed humans to accomplish his plan. He takes messes and he makes something beautiful. All right? Leading up to Jesus, if we look at the Old Testament especially, what we can see is, man, are these the examples? And quite honestly, right? I mean, as we look at, at Scripture, who's our example? I mean, if we just, if we, if we just kind of look at a glance, we could say, man, uh, you know, Jesus has given us, or God has given us so many examples of, of people that, that he was able to, to take out of the muck and the failure and, and, and to make something and use them, right? Uh, that song, Graves in the Gardens, uh, says something like, it says something like this, all right? These are the words. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. I just want to stop for a minute and listen to that. The graves in the gardens. Over and over we see in, in Scripture that, that Jesus took, or excuse me, that, that God took something that looked like it was a grave. And he brought something up out of it. Joseph was sold into slavery. He was thrown into prison. In some way, somehow, he brought a garden from it. Joseph ended up being second in command in Egypt, right? Job, Job lost everything, and it looked like it, everything was done, but at the end of the book, God blessed him greater than he had been before. And we have Jesus as a real good example of graves in the gardens, right? I mean, he came from being buried to being resurrected. You turn bones into armies, that's a reference from Ezekiel chapter, chapter 37, where, where God gives him a vision. Israel at the time had been carried off they had been pretty much almost demolished and uh, and god shows ezekiel hey i can make an army out of just dry bones he turns seas into highways we have the red sea in the, in scripture we have the red sea that we're, we're where moses parts the red sea and they walk across on dry land you're the only one who We have story after story of God taking people in situations that are what we, that we would consider failures only to use them in awesome ways. But here's the deal. Jesus comes along as the good teacher. And by his life and the way he lived and loved, he was showing us what the A project looked like. Now, of, of course there's hope, right? Because he started off as an A project. But, but there is hope for you. And, and because I know, because God, God was able to use people like Abraham, who was old, Elijah, who was suicidal, uh, Joseph was abused. Moses had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jacob was a liar. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Jonah, he ran from God, and, and God still used all of them, but they are not our example of what it looks like. And maybe, just possibly, that has been our picture. That, that we go through our life and we just hope somehow that God will use us even through our, you know, our own stupid choices. The model, the picture that Jesus gives us of the finished product, of where he's going with it, isn't any of those guys. It is himself. A good teacher gives his students a picture of what an A project looks like. Now, in fact, I want us to see this. It's in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews starts off with these words. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Let me, let me pause for a minute, okay? In the past, these were your samples. These were your examples of what you were kind of shooting for. Uh, but in the last days, in these last days, 
he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe do you, do you hear what he's saying in these last days the son jesus who has become the heir of everything and who he actually is the one who who was involved in making the universe the son Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And I want you to see this. And the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, let me put it this way. What we're told, we see it in Hebrews. Jesus is the exact imprint of God. What is God like? It's Jesus. He is an example or the exemplar of what it looks like to have mastery over the subject. He's the picture of what he is creating in us. Jesus lived it, and he actually tells us we can too. In fact, he he calls us to live like him calls us into to live into the picture that he gives us this is his this is his expectation this is what he says is acceptable that's what it looks like let's not put some other model in there right well that's a little bit like i had a a a guy in my uh in i think it was i was a sophomore or junior and um uh, the teacher wasn't looking. She rarely looked, but we were taking a test, and he turned around, and he grabbed my, my test, and he, and he wrote down all of my answers. And I couldn't help but think, <laughs> I'm not an expert in this. Why are you copying my stuff, right? Uh, and so I was a bad example maybe for him, but it was better apparently than what he was trying to do. If we model ourselves out of so- after somebody else, maybe somebody in scripture or somebody you know in church, you're modeling after a substitute. Jesus gave us the end product. He gave us what he's shooting for within us, and it is his life. That's what a good teacher does. A good teacher replaces I instead of F. A good teacher gives, an, gives us a picture of what it looks like to master this topic. What a project is. Well, and the second thing is a good teacher seeks to understand before being understood. This is a real short one. Let me put it this way. Jesus knew everybody that came to talk to him. Jesus knew this ruler. He knew what was going on in his heart. That's why he stopped on this, t- this little phrase, why do you call me good, right? Uh, he understood. The, the, the idea is the good teacher will understand where the student is, the challenges that that student has, so that as they teach them, they take that into account. Right? One of my f- biggest frustrations when I was in college, it always felt like m- my professors didn't ever take into consideration that I had other classes that were also piling all kinds of work on. Good teachers... They understood that there were other factors involved in the learning process. See, Jesus' desire isn't just for us to hand some work in. His desire is that we produce quality work. We're not just supposed to simply complete a project we can put it this way. Do we? I, I had somebody tell me, I don't want to just get into heaven smelling like smoke. In other words, I don't want to just barely get into heaven by, by the skin of my teeth. I understand. That's not the way that works. I understand that. But what's the, our heart? Is our heart, what's the, what's the least I can do and still make it to heaven? Or is my heart? How can I serve the God of the universe? who has been so good to me. 
A good teacher is more concerned about quality than just a deadline. We see this in how Jesus answers the one who asked the question. He understood him. Hey, wait, 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 wait. wait. You want to know about, about eternal life, but, but we need you to un- I need you to understand the title that you just gave me. You, you need to understand what you've just done when you said good teacher. And here's why, I, here's why I see he understands and he's more interested in quality than just a deadline. Look, we find it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do you hear it? He is waiting because his desire is that we master it, that we get it, that we get it. He is taking into account the learning process. He's patient with us. Throughout the gospel, we see Jesus know people when they come to talk to him. He always understands us. I hope that is part of one of your foundational pieces of understanding Jesus. He always understands us. Do we cling to this truth? He always understands us. He knows our heart. He knows what we're capable of. He is a, the good teacher knows what we can do and what we can't do. So when he comes to us and he says, this is what I want you to do, this is what I'm telling you to do, and we go, but God, right? Oh, but Jesus, you don't understand. No, he actually does understand. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And he's taken all that into consideration in teaching us See, because, it, because, because he understands us. And when he commands us to do something, he already knows that his expectation is realistic. His expectation is right. Now, I want to I just kind of wrap this up with this thought. A good teacher, okay, a good teacher brings freedom to his students. And I got to tell you, when you master a subject, right? When you master a subject, it brings freedom. Think about it, a person who, who, who doesn't know how to read. You need to think about just the, the world in front of them that they're not even able to be a part of because they can't read. They step up into, they go to a restaurant and they sit there and look at a menu and they have no idea what it says. We sit around and we read things off of a page and they just have to listen. All it does is create these barriers and boundaries. But a good teacher instead brings freedom to a, to a student. Okay, so, so we've been covering Luke chapter, I mean Luke, and, and looking at it through this lens of Christ formed in me. And, and, and how, do I, how do I put that into this passage? Well, l- let me put it this way, okay? I have spent part of my Christian life thinking I was in a school that might kick me out if I failed too many times. Okay? Jesus is the teacher. His, being in his classroom is the school. And I spent part of my Christian life thinking that if I failed too many times, he was just going to say, hey, it's time to get out. You're not getting it. Give up. That, I was more, that he was more concerned about completing an assignment rather than the quality of the product. Sometimes, okay, sometimes I've even thought to myself, Jesus, you don't understand what you're asking of me. I can't do that. See, in that school, I saw Jesus as a teacher who was making me look like everybody else. This is where it shows up, right? I feel called to ministry. God probably wants to send me to Africa because that's where he sends everybody called to ministry. No, he doesn't, right? 
Oh, God's calling me to ministry. Uh, I'm supposed to be a pastor. Is that what he... See, we have these idea of these certain molds that Jesus kind of pushes us into. The problem is, is he knows us. He knows what mastery looks like, and he, is com- he commands us based on what he knows of us. And he knows everything about us. He created us, right? He created us for a certain thing. And so when we live into what he's teaching, we're living into the way he created us to be. We have a tendency to make this this mold. And we say, "This this is what a Christian looks like. This is it doesn't vary for anybody between anybody this is what it looks like to be a follower of jesus this is what it looks like to surrender to him and we call it cookie cutter christians you see the school that i was in now i, I say i have spent part of my christian life in that school and, and i'm not going to blame my church growing up i'm not going to blame my education i All it is, is I needed a deeper relationship with him in order to discover the type of teacher he is. Jesus is opening my eyes and showing me the school that I'm actually in. He's not changing. My picture or my my view of him is changing. See, I'm still realizing it. I'm still realizing I'm in the school that I'm in. Because there are times he isn't the teacher that I think he is. Sometimes I forget that he is the good teacher. See, he doesn't stamp failure on my failure. Rather, he reminds me that it's incomplete. Let's get back up. Let's do this again. We're going to get mastery over this. It's okay. Look where you, look where you messed up. Look what you, you didn't understand. Look at your misunderstanding of this and this. Let's get up. Let's try this again. He doesn't sit here and go, fail, fail, fail. He says, no, you're not complete yet. See, sometimes I forget he's the good teacher. He continues to show me what it looks like to live the life he wants me to live. You know where he does that? When I read his story. And I can make up what it looks like to be a Christian. I can, in my head, I can have this picture of what I think it looks like. He is the model. And the only way I'm going to get a pic- an accurate picture of that model is if I read the story. If I look at the way he lived. Sometimes I forget he's the good teacher. And I lose sight of the picture that he's given me of what an A project looks like. Sometimes I forget that he's the good teacher, but he knows me. He understands me. He knows the challenges. He knows the roadblocks. And he knows what ones are real and which ones are, are lies or they're fake or they're excuses. When he commands me, he has already taken into consideration my limitations and the issues that will slow me down. His expectations of me are realistic. No matter what I think, they are realistic. He's the good teacher. And his school is about bringing me freedom rather than a mold for me to fit into. Okay? So he knows me. His expectations uh, of me are realistic. His school is about freedom rather than a mold to fit me into. There is only 
one school that will produce the formation of Christ in us. And it's not the school that I thought I was in. It's the school that we actually are in, and we need to discover it. He's the good teacher. The real question is, will you choose him as your teacher? And look, Jesus never said he wasn't good. As he stopped with this, this ruler, he didn't deny that he was God. He just needed to stop him there and recognize, he, that guy needed to recognize what he was saying. So remember this, because this is true. As we look at the story and we look where Jesus paused, he didn't say, I'm not good. He's just connecting the picture. So he, the, the questioner recognizes Jesus is the good teacher. Jesus is God. See, only God is good. But Jesus, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's being. So, he's the good teacher, but are you demonstrating you are capable of what he is teaching? Are you demonstrating that you are capable of what he's teaching? That's what he's going for. Are you living into it? Because he is the good teacher. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, I... I wish I was farther along. I wish my picture of you was better, more accurate. Because sometimes you're a, you're a much better teacher than I realize because I carry with me all this other stuff. And I know that I'm not complete. I know that you're working on it. But, but I pray for us that you would help us to see you more clearly as the good teacher. That we would, that we would learn from you. That we would recognize that, that you're not finished with us. That we would recognize that you are our example. That we would recognize you know us when you tell us something. You, you know that you're material. You know who we are. And you know, your expectations are realistic. Would you help us to see? You bring us freedom. When we apply what you're teaching us. It opens a whole new world for us. Would you work in us? Would you be formed in us? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for coming to, uh, for tuning in today, and I pray that you would uh, you'd let this sink in, that he would be your good teacher. Have a great day.